All right, so now in Genesis chapter number 27, I don't know if I'm going to go through necessarily every single verse. So let's give, um, I'm just going to give kind of a brief overview of the entire chapter. Basically what happens is, um, you know, Isaac calls Esau and he tells Esau, he's like, okay, go, I want some venison. I love, I love that venison that you make. You know, and Esau was a hunter, so he's like, go out, you know, get me some venison, bring it back, and then I'll give you a blessing. I'll bless your soul, you know, my soul will give you a blessing. So he sends him off. And Rebekah, his wife, Isaac's wife, was listening in on the conversation he had with Esau. And she heard that and, was, and she, you know, she favorited Jacob, whereas Isaac favorited Esau. And she hears this and she wants Jacob to get the blessing. So she concocts a plan and tells him, you know, okay, I want you to, you know, go get me two kids of the goats. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this nice meat for your father. I'm going to make him this venison for, for him to eat that, um, that you can bring into him and that he'll bless you. And at first, Jacob's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I don't want, uh, what, what's going to happen if he wants to touch me? Because Esau was real hairy. He was just a, just a real hairy guy. And, and Jacob wasn't. So he's like, if, I, if he wants to touch me, he's going to know right away that I'm not Esau. And he's going to say, he's going to look at me like a deceiver and he's going to curse me instead of giving me a blessing. And his mother's like, you know, know what? He's like, she's like, you know what? Your curse will be upon me, but just go and do what I tell you to do. So she puts these, you know, the skin of the goats that they had killed for, the, for her to make meat for him, the skin with all the hair and everything on his arms and on his neck. So that way they could, that he can trick Isaac into thinking that he is that he is Esau. So he goes in, he does all that, and at first, you know, Isaac doesn't quite, you know, he's like, "What well, your voice? It sounds like Jacob." But then he called him near. He feels him. He's okay. You know, you're Esau. So he eats the meat. It's a really good meal. Of course, Rebecca knows how to make food for her husband, right? She makes it just the way he likes it. He eats it, and he ends up blessing Jacob. And then just as soon as he's out of there, you know, his father eats. He blesses him. Everything else. He's gone. What happens? Esau comes in, right? And Esau is real upset. Well, first he's like, okay, dad, I'm here. You know, I got the venison. And Isaac's like, what? And he starts to tremble a little bit. He's like, he gets confused. Like, what just happened? What do you mean you just came? He's like, I just ate your venison. You know, like, what do you mean? And then he realizes what Jacob had done, that Jacob actually came in and deceived him. And of course, Esau gets really upset. And he's crying and weeping and wailing and just, you know, you know, please give me a blessing, even me. And we kind of went over this a couple weeks ago um, where I get a little bit more in depth in it tonight. But um, and then, of course, Isaac really doesn't give him a blessing. And in his blessing to Esau, he, he tells him he's going to serve his brother, which was the blessing that he gave unto Jacob. And um, that's that's the overview of the entire story of everything that happens in Genesis 27. But. Of course, there's a lot for us still to learn in this story. There's a lot of principles that we need to, to go over. So let's get started here in the beginning of the chapter. In uh, verse number three, says, Now therefore, he's telling Esau, Take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And as I mentioned you know, in my synopsis, Esau was Isaac's favorite. If you remember back in Genesis 25, verse number 28 reads, And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. So that's one of, one of the big factors for Isaac. Of course, you know, probably like most men, you get to his heart through his belly, right? He just, you know, you give him some really good food and, and you've got his affection won over. And that's what Esau did. You know, Esau was a hunter. He, he, was, he was good at hunting. He brought him some venison, and his dad really liked that. It says, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but it seems like each one kind of had their favorite. You know, Rebecca had her favorite, and Isaac had his favorite. But um, that's, that's the way it was. And, of course, also, Esau was the firstborn. So it, it makes sense that, that Isaac wanted to bless Esau before he died. Now, it's also interesting that you know, Isaac at this point in his life, is, he doesn't know. I mean, he's already old, old enough to where his eyes are dim. He can't really see. You know, his vision's pretty much gone. That's why Jacob was even able to, to deceive him. So he's getting older. 
you can only imagine some of his other senses were probably starting to go as with all people you know your vision starts to fail other things and he thinks he's like i don't know when i'm going to die so i just want to make sure that i give you this blessing because he thinks his time is soon but he actually lives for like decades longer you know he, he lives on to be a very old man and we'll see that later but um you know at this point in his life he's he's blessing him even though um he wasn't really going to die but he didn't know that now um of course because rebecca favored jacob she wanted jacob to receive that blessing so she concocted this plan for him to steal basically to steal that blessing from esau to go in and um uh, you know, as I mentioned before, Jacob didn't want to do it at first. When she, when she tells him about it, she says, okay, I want you to bring me two kids to go. You're going to go in and you're going to get that blessing. Now, he's like, no problem getting the blessing. But at the same time, he's like, I don't want to get cursed. You know, I don't want to go in there and try to get this blessing and then wind up leaving getting cursed, right? Because, you know, I like you know, what he says in, um, in verse 12, my father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver. Yeah, you, you, I wonder why you'd seem to him as a deceiver, right? Maybe because you are deceiving him. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. And um, look at what, it, what his mom says in verse 13. She says, and, his, and it says, the Bible reads, And his mother said unto him, Upon me, be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me then. So, a lot of things happen as a result of this. Now, we're going to get in, excuse me, get into this in, in the next couple weeks as well. But Jacob does not go get away unpunished for what he does here, for his deception here with his brother. Because he, he, he basically steals that, that, um, that blessing from Esau. And the way that he did it is by lying, by being deceitful, right? By saying he was someone he wasn't. And if you know Genesis, if you know these stories very well, we're going to be going um, in the next few chapters, we're going to see when Jacob goes to marry um, Rachel, excuse me, I'm like, why am I not totally as Drew? Like, Jacob goes to marry Rachel, and he loved Rachel a lot, but what happened to him, Laban deceives Jacob and gives him Leah, his firstborn, to wife. So this deception that he plays against Esau comes back on him again late you know, in the future. And we'll, we'll notice this is kind of a theme that we're going to be going over tonight is how people end up reaping what they sow. And you always end up reaping worse than what you originally came out with, right? So when you sin and, and you think you're getting away with something, like at this point, you know, did Jacob get away with this from at this point? Yes, he did. Jacob got away with it in the short term, in the short run. He got that blessing. He got out of there. No one saw any different. He got the blessing, and, his, and his Isaac's like, well, he is blessed, right? He got away with it temporarily. But when you know the results of his actions later on, you're going to see his deception come back around with him. He was deceived by Laban. He was deceived for, you know, when, when he swapped out Leah for Rachel. He was also deceived just working for him. His wages were changed, you know, 10 times. All this other stuff was going on. And I believe that was a direct result of, of Jacob's own actions and the way that, that he deceived Esau and deceived, well, deceived Isaac to steal that, um, that blessing from Esau. Now, I'm bringing that up because you notice his mother said, well, upon me be thy curse. But was she really able to make that type of a, or a, or a proclamation just saying, well, your curse is going to be on me? Does she really have control over that? No. I mean, she could say it all day long. We have zero evidence from the Bible that this curse came upon Rebecca, because God holds us all individually responsible for the things that we do. And now notice, 
it says here, she said, you know, upon me be thy curse, my son, only obey my voice and go fetch me them. So what do we do in the Bible when the Bible says that we need to obey our father and mother? Because think about this. Jacob was living at home with his father and mother, right? He was not married. He did not leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife yet. He wasn't married at this point in his life. He was still under the authority. Even if he is an older man, he's still under the authority of his father and his mother. So his mother's telling him to do something and she says, okay, well, obey my voice, right? And the Bible says that we need to honor our father and mother and we need to listen to them. They have the authority over us as children, even if you're an adult, but you're living at home when you're under their household, you're under their rules. And it's, you know, especially when you haven't gone off and gotten married and, you know, done all that and, and you become the head of your own household, you are still under their authority. So, so what do we do here? Well, we have to understand the levels of authority that God has even ordained, right? So God has given us human government as one level of authority. And human government, he's given parameters on where their authority extends to. So the, the purpose that God has given for government is for the punishment of evildoers. So when someone goes and, and commits a crime against somebody else, it, the government's there to make sure that justice is served and that the perpetrator the, you know, has to pay for what he's done wrong against the victim. Right? Pretty simple. Now, that's the realm of their jurisdiction. That's what they have authority over. They do not have authority over the church. They do not have authority over your family to just go in and tell you how to run things in your personal life and tell you how to do things. That is not within the realm of their jurisdiction. Family, God's ordained that the father's ahead of the household, right? But it's for your own household. So God has given me the realm of authority over my wife and children. That's mine. Now I can't go to your wife and say, you know, like, I'm going to tell your wife what to do. That's outside of the realm of my jurisdiction. This is where I'm at. God has ordained the authority structure within the family, right? For each family individually, for their, you know, the father or husband in that situation. In the church, there's a realm of authority, right? You have a pastor, elder, overseer of the church, but of course, God's at the top. And then you have the, the overseer or overseers of the church, and then everybody else within the church. But again, that's limited to within the body, within the congregation. Outside of the congregation, it's, you know, I don't have any authority to tell. Like, I can't tell you, you need to be doing this and doing that, and, and you can't have a TV in your house, and you can't, you know, like, I can't, I could preach that it's a sin. I could preach on things like that, but I'm not, I can't just, like, tell you and make you do things at home that's outside of the realm of my authority here. It's within the church. So God has given the parents a certain authority within the family. And one of the things, it's, it's, you know, they have authority over their children. So Jacob needs to observe that. But there's a higher authority that goes above the parents. And just like all of the realms of authority I've given, God is at the top. You know, if it's like a little, you know, all these little pyramids of, of authority, of structure of someone here, and then they have people below them, right? You have a church, government, you know, family, and they're all separate from each other. And then you have God at the top. He is the ultimate lawgiver. He is the ultimate source of authority. So if you're going to defer to anything, you have to continually go to the highest source. That's why if you think about it this way, in, in our country, even just with the laws in general, you, you have city ordinances, right? You've got state laws and there are federal laws. And there's all these different things. Now, what happens, though, when there's a contradiction, when there's a conflict? Well, they appeal to the highest laws. So this state, for example, can create some kind of a law that says you're not allowed to, you know, preach the gospel. Well, they could make that law. I mean, it's a state. They can go through, they can put it through the legislature, they can make that law. But... If there's a dispute about that law, if it goes to court and you say, no, no, this, you know, this isn't right because it violates a higher law, which in this case would be, for example, the, you know, the Constitution of the United States, the highest law of the land, the way that our system is set up, that is supposed to be, you know, trumps all of the other laws. So if you make a law that's contradictory to the Constitution, then it's considered, it's deemed unconstitutional, it's nullified, it's invalid, 
and it just gets tossed aside. It has no weight, no bearing, nothing. It's it's just mean. It's meaningless, right? Well, with God, it's the same way. He is, you know, like the Constitution, right? In, in, that, in that example, he is the 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 final authority what we go to. So. If someone in our own little authority structure, like the pastor of a church, or the head of the household, the husband, the father, tells someone beneath them to do something that's contrary to what God says, you always go with what God says over what that person says. Always. No question about it. So in this case, you know, the Bible tells us not to lie, right? Not to bear false witness. But what did Jacob's mother tell him to do? to lie, to tell him to go in and tell your father that you're Esau so that he'll bless you in order to get that blessing. She was telling him directly to, con you know, to, to sin, to contradict God's laws. So the right thing for him to do would have been to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And God held Jacob responsible for his own actions. And um, we see that even going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Right? What happened in the garden? Well, the serpent approached Eve and said, Hey, look at this fruit. It's good to eat. It's, a, it's, a, it's something, you know, what, what did God really say? Did he, he didn't say you're surely going to die. Right? He, he knows. He knows that when you eat of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, he says, you're going to be like God's. And he just talks in her ear and persuades her enough for her to take of the fruit and to eat it. And then she brings it under her husband, right? And then he eats of the fruit also. Now, God held, did, did God hold uh, Adam responsible? Yes, he did. And he cursed him, right? And he said, you're gonna, you know, the, the ground's going to be cursed. You're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. You did this. What about the woman? Did he hold her responsible? Yes, he did. You say, oh, yeah, but, and, and this is exactly what they did. He's like, you know, he confronts Adam. He's like, Adam, why do you do this? He's like, well, the woman, you know, like, you, you know, she gave it to me and I ate. You know, it's her fault. She's the one that brought it to me and, and, and told me to eat it. Just like Jacob would say here, well, well, my mom told me to do it. And my mom said, well, the curse will be on me. But is that going to fly with God? It didn't with Adam and Eve. Adam got his punishment, Eve got her punishment, and the serpent even got his punishment. They were all culpable, but they're all responsible for their own actions, for what they did. That God holds each one of us individually. Even if someone, so one of the things that you got to make sure you're not doing, and I'll, I have no problem saying this, even in church, you know, just because a pastor says to do something, you cannot rely on what he says. To just make to just say, well, it must be right because the pastor said so, and use that as like an excuse. You know, that's what the what the Nazi soldiers tried to to use as as their um, you know as their justification for what they did in the in the Nuremberg trials. They say, well, our commanders commanded us to do these things, but that that defense doesn't work. It's not justification for your own for your own actions, and God holds us responsible for our own. Now. If the pastor is just preaching lies and teaching you to do something that's wrong, will God hold him responsible? Yes. There is, there is that. You know, the pastor will have his own punishment, but you, individually, in the pew, you can't just say, well, he said it was right, so that's why I'm doing it. He says, no, you are going to be held responsible too because you're in sin. You need to be able to make sure that you know that what you're doing is right and not just relying on what someone else tells you to do. And most people don't want to do that because it requires effort on their part. It's a lot easier to be spoon-fed than it is to pick up the spoon and feed yourself. It's a lot easier just to sit there and go, ah, 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 and just feed me, feed me, feed me, than it is for you to just say, you know what, no, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to get my plate, I'm going to put some food on it, I'm going to cut it up, and I'm going to eat it myself. Right now, even in that example, you know, getting the plate, it's really not that much work, but people are really lazy and reading the Bible and studying the Bible, knowing the Bible really isn't that much work. It's really not to be responsible for what you believe is right and wrong does not take much of your time to just keep up so that you can discern whether or not what the pastor is saying is true. Honestly. If, if you just spent 15 minutes a day, 
15 minutes, you could have the entire Bible read cover to cover within a year. That is not, and that is not much work. That is not much effort just for 15 minutes out of your day. That's not a lot. That is very, very, very little. Think about some of the things you do with your time, how much time you spend. I mean, these days, think about how much time people spend just on Facebook. I guarantee you there's a lot of people that are that get on Facebook that are spending more than 15 minutes out of their day. When you add up all the time they get on there throughout the day, it's more than 15 minutes. And you're going to tell me you can't take the 15 minutes out of your day to read the Bible? And that is like, and I'm not saying that that is the standard. I'm saying look at how little time it takes to even, to even get through the Bible once in a year and to start to know for yourself what it says so that you don't have to rely on someone else always just telling you this is what it is. And look, I'm all for coming to church and learning and being taught. There's nothing wrong with that, but you still are responsible for what you believe and what you do. You ultimately are the one that's responsible and God will hold you responsible for your own actions. God held Jacob responsible for his own actions and he ended up reaping a lot more than he ended up sowing. Let's, um, and, you know, and I don't think I, I read this verse, but in Acts chapter 5, verse 28, you know, the, this is where the, the rulers were confronting Peter and the apostles for preaching in the name of Christ. We remember, they were getting threatened. They were telling me, you know, don't preach in the name of Jesus. And they were trying to, to overstep the bounds that they had as governmental authority to tell these people what they can and can't say, what they can and can't preach. That is way outside the realm of their authority that God has given them. Verse 28 says, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And that's the attitude we need to have. We, need to, we, would, we ought to obey God rather than men. When someone tells you something or tells you to do something and it's contrary to what God says, I don't care where it is. And even if it's at your job, you know, if, as an employee, you're like a servant to your master, to the boss, right? The employee in a boss relationship, you are under you are you are in under his rule, right? Under his authority within the job. But I'll tell you what, like if if my if my boss ever tells me to like to, that I have to lie to do something, my job, I'm not going to do it. Now I'll be respect as respectful as I can and polite as I can and and, and just explain why I'm not going to do it and it's you know that I whatever but I'm not going to I'm not going to do it just like Daniel did when he was being told to to drink wine and eat the the meat that was probably offered unto idols and he says you know he very politely respectfully just said that he wasn't going to do it and um that's the attitude that we need to have. And, and it doesn't matter where that authority person is coming from, whether it's from work, whether it's from church, whether it's from you know, your house. If someone's telling you to do something contrary to Scripture, you need to make sure for yourself that you are responsible to God and that you obey God rather than men. So we see what Rebecca did here in verse 15 of Genesis 27. The Bible says, And Rebecca took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. So she dresses them in Esau's clothing. And then she puts the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me arise. I pray thee sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Now, you know, a lot of times people like to have a justification for their sins. There is no justification. You know, people will say like, well, I didn't really lie. Right? You could go, you could kind of not quite say everything. And, and not quite, you, you can let people think whatever they want to think and say, well, you know, I didn't lie to him. But Jacob can't say that here. I mean, he came in and, and Isaac's like, well, who are you? He's like, 
I'm Esau, that, that firstborn. Just, just right off, just real brazen. I'm Esau. He's like, and I did what you told me to do. He didn't tell him to do anything. He wasn't even there. So he says, Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Verse 20, And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? So he's saying, Wow, that was fast. You know, I didn't send you out that long ago because they had the, the, the goats right there, right? They were able to, to kill them, you know, prepare them, cook them. He's expecting it's going to take a while before his son actually goes out, hunts, you know, finds an animal to kill, kills it, prepares it, and then brings it back. But he was able to get this done real quickly because, of course, Rebecca had the, the goats right there and you know, got it done real fast. So he's like, well, wait a minute, you know, how did you get this done so fast? He's starting to question already. And he said, and look at this, not only does he lie about like just being Esau, he says, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. He brings God into his lie. He's saying, you know what? Well, your God brought it to me. He brought it right here. You know, here I am. He brought it to me. And, and man, this is, he just made it all work out just for you. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. So now he's starting to, to really question. He's like, wait a minute. You know, come here. I want to I wanna touch you because, you know, the, the story isn't quite adding up for him. In verse 22, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and said, the voice is Jacob's voice. So he's able to discern the voice. He's like, this, sound, this, is, this is Jacob's voice. But the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. So that's the, the turning point. That's the proof that he needed was just feeling his hands in order for him to, to bless him and to, and to get rid of those doubts that were in his mind. Now, this is very interesting. If you haven't heard this before um, or seen this or noticed this, that Isaac is relying on his feeling to identify his son and he was deceived, right? Our senses will often be the source of deception for us. You know, you, you've heard the phrase where you can't always believe what you see. A lot of people say, well, I need to see it in order to believe it. But your eyes can play tricks on you. You can see things that you don't often know. And, what's, and, and you know, I didn't really know, and I don't know the statistics on this, but look up how often eyewitness accounts get things wrong. It's amazing. I, I, I've seen it before, and I don't, I don't remember, like, the exact numbers or statistics on it, but, the, you know, the... The police are used to it because they gather reports all the time at a crime scene. Well, what happened? And you, they always have conflicting stories. There's always people that, that you know, they're, they're honestly trying, you know, they're not trying to lie. They're just recounting what they thought they saw. And when you compare it to what actually happened, especially when they have like, they come up with like video surveillance, you know, footage, it's like, whoa, this is what, and I'm not talking about the cops that lie to cover themselves. I'm just talking about just, just random eyewitnesses that have no stake in the game that are just trying to say, oh yeah, we saw him in a, you know, in a, in a Chevy Tahoe driving off and it was like not even close, right? Not even the same type of vehicle, but that's just their view. That's what they remember. That's what they think they saw, even if it's not the truth of what they actually saw. So our senses can very often deceive us, especially our eyes, and um, we can't always just rely on them to know what's true. Now, notice that he can discern the voice, but he was deceived by the feeling. So one of his senses is true. This is hearing. He was able to tell it was Jacob's voice, but the feeling was off. Now, God's voice should be known to you today. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 29. If you remember in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We should be able to recognize the voice of God. That's why when you compare a King James Bible with any of these other modern uh, false versions of the Bible, it's very clear which one is God's words, which one is the voice of God, and which one's just a, a forgery, which one's just a fake, which one's just a deceptive fraud. 
right? It's easy to see that because God's word. And, and what you're going to see in Psalm 29 is about the voice of God, which is God's word. In verse 1, we'll read the whole psalm. Psalm 29, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And think about this in context of God's words. God's voice comes out, rings out of the Bible, out of his words. Right? He speaks his words. The voice of the Lord is powerful. It's mighty. It's full of majesty. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Now, just like Isaac was unable to see Jacob because his eyes were dim. Remember, he was blind. He wasn't able to see him. We literally can't see God with our eyes either. Right? But we can hear his voice. We can hear his words. And we should be able to trust his voice. And Isaac should have been able to trust what he heard from the voice. How many times can you read something in the Bible and you know the voice, you know the words, but then you're deceived by some other feeling into thinking that maybe that wasn't the voice, maybe, that was, you know, maybe that's not what the Bible says. An example is where people try to judge what's right and wrong based more on some feeling than they get, that they get, whether it be an emotion or just some internal feeling that they feel about what's right and what's wrong, instead of just the voice of God, right? The voice of the Lord is what we need to be relying on. An example would be, for example, going out soul winning, preaching the gospel to every creature. You can go out... And uh, it's very clear from Scripture that we need to do that. God's Word, God's voice is telling us, you need to preach the gospel to every creature over and over again. It's throughout the Bible. You're listening to God's voice. You're going to hear that commandment. You're going to hear Him telling you to do that. But what if you try to go out and do that? You know, someone just for the first time, they try to go out and something goes real wrong. You know, someone screams at them and yells at them and slams the door in their face. Like, oh man, you know, that didn't go out very well. And then you try to talk to someone else and, and you drop the Bible and like, you know, you don't even know what to say. Your mind goes blank and you're like, well, I just don't, I, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Maybe, maybe that's not for me. Maybe God didn't give me the gift. Maybe God's not really using me to do this. So I'm going to go and do something else. And you feel, you know, like intimidated. You feel, you know, scared. You feel something else. You're like, well, I, if I'm doing what's right according to God, then why would I feel this? Well, this can't be right. This can't be of God. Right? That's just one example. And people get that way over lots of things in the Bible. So that just doesn't quite feel right. Especially when it comes to contradicting things that maybe you've been taught your whole life or maybe that this culture is just ingrained into your head as being correct and being true. But then you hear something different in the Bible and say, well, that doesn't feel right. Like these days, when people hear about homosexuality and, and God putting the death penalty on that, they'll say, oh, well, you know, that doesn't seem right. Well, that doesn't seem right to me. You know, a loving God wouldn't do that. You, you know, what's the big deal? That's just, I mean, they were born that way. And, you know, you, and you're fed all these lies and all this propaganda from Satan and from the media into the point to where it's impacted you enough to, to have a different feeling. You say, well, that, that doesn't feel right. It's what the voice says. We need to trust the voice more than the feeling. That's what got Jacob deceived. He didn't trust the voice. He knew that was Jacob's voice. He heard it. He said, oh, that's ja even though he's lying to me, he knew the voice of his own son. But he relied on the feeling. 
and the feeling deceived him. Another example of how this world can influence your feelings through deception would be the quote that, you know, and you hear this all the time, people telling you, well, hate the sin and love the sinner, right? And we know that that's, anyone who's been around long enough knows that that, that quote comes directly from Gandhi, right? A non-believer, some, you know, some guy that's burning in hell right now, because he didn't receive Christ as his Savior, is the one that, that all the Christians these days will try to espouse and form doctrine saying, well, yeah, we need to hate the sin and love the sinner because it's just a catchy phrase and it just sounds good, right? But is that what the voice of the Lord is saying? Is that what the Bible is actually teaching? That that, that is what we're supposed to do. And people will hear preaching to the contrary and say, well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't feel right. Yeah, because you've been brainwashed. Because... You've been too impacted by the Gandhis of this world into thinking that that's the truth. But you have to go based on the voice, based on the Word of God. Scripture tells us in 2 Chronicles verse number, or chapter 19, verse 1 reads, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, because what's the opposite of hating this? You know, it says, if, if we're supposed to hate the sin but love the sinner, Right? He's saying the love, the sinner. Now look, in many cases, is that is that still true? Do we love sinners? Yes, we're all. I mean, we're all sinners, right? We're supposed to love each other. So there is that aspect of it. But you know, and I know that that's not what people are using this for, because people will come out and say that when you say, "Well, there's certain people that I hate." You say we can't hate anyone. You could only hate the sin and not the sinner at all, and that is not true. 2 Chronicles 19.1, it says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So the Bible teaches us, and in many places, I'm only going to turn to two places. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 139. Because this teaching is consistent in Scripture. 2 Chronicles 19, where I just read, he's saying, look, are you, should, you be, should you be helping the ungodly? Should you love them that hate the Lord? But I thought we're supposed to hate the sin, but love the sinner. He says, should you love them that hate the Lord? Now look, this doesn't say love them that hate you, your personal enemy. He says, should you love them that hate God? that have a hatred for the Lord. And he says, because you did this, because you helped them, because you love them that hate God, therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. God's wrath came upon Jehoshaphat because he loved them that hated the Lord. Which is completely contrary to hate the sin but love the sinner. This says love them, the people. Right? And that's the same thing that that, that, that teaching says we, we are supposed to do. Psalm 139, look at verse 21. David, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, wrote, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them, not their sin. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. This is what the Bible teaches, and it's consistent. There are other places, you know, Ecclesiastes 3, it says there's a time to love and a time to hate. Okay? It's not just a sin. Now, are we supposed to hate the sin? Yes. Of course we are, and that's evident throughout the Bible. There's plenty of scripture that tells us we need to hate the sin. But there are certain people that we should be hating as well. Now, look. It's not like it's some huge number. It's not just anyone who wrongs you because, again, it's not saying your personal enemies. Someone who does you wrong, that's not the person you hate. It's the reprobate, false prophet people that are leading people to hell. You know, the, 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 the children of Belial, children of the devil, that hate the, that hate the Lord, that hate God. Those are the ones that it's okay to hate. For us to hate those that hate God. Look at Romans 1. They'll give you all the, all the characteristics of people that hate God. Because one of them is haters of God. So to hate them that hate God is appropriate. It's not just okay, it's appropriate. 
And that's what the Bible... But see, people hear that and they say, well, that doesn't feel right. It just, it just doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's right. We just read the Scripture. Are you going to go off of the voice? Or are you going to go off of the feeling? Feeling can be deceptive. Mormons these days will tell you, when you ask them why they know they're saved, if you, if you talk to them long enough... Well, and you talk about their conversion and say, well, I had this, this great overwhelming feeling came over me that I just know I was right. I asked God, and they all have the same testimony, all of them. I asked God to just show me the truth about this because it's been brainwashed into them. They've, they've been programmed that from a young, from a young person going to, going to their, their Satan-worshipping church for so long. That's why they all have the same testimony of just, well, I asked God to tell me, is this really true? And I had this overwhelming experience and feeling that God answered my prayer so that I felt at peace and in comfort knowing that this is true. I'm talking about the Book of Mormon. I asked God and He said this is true. They all tell you the same thing. And they're trusting in their feeling. They're not trusting God's Word because you can show a point back. Look, look, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. They're not trusting in the voice. They're not trusting the word. They're trusting their feeling. Yeah, but I asked God and, you know, this warm fuzzy came over me. And I just, I just know that this is right because God wouldn't lie to me and he's the one that gave me. How do you know that God made you feel that way? Be careful with the, with the feelings that you're trusting in. Let's go back to Genesis 27. Look at verse 34. This is after the blessing on Isaac and Esau comes in and basically Isaac said, well, you know, I blessed him and he is going to be blessed because I gave him that blessing. Verse 34, and when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Now, what, what Esau said here, is that really true that, that he supplanted him these two times by taking away his birthright? and now taking away his blessing? No. We know that he did take away the blessing. He did that in deceit. He did that in guile. He stole that. He took that away from him. That was wrong. But look at the attitude of Esau. He has this poor me attitude about from, this, from the earlier event of selling his birthright. And we're going to see that this is, you know, we're talking about reaping what you sow. When Esau sold his birthright, he thought, well, it wasn't a big deal at the time. He's like, well, I'll sell this because I just need some food right now. I need to fill my belly. What good is this birthright going to do me if I die? If you remember, and, that, and that's how Jacob got that birthright. He sold it to him. He didn't deceive him. He didn't trick him. He just said, okay, well, you have a birthright and I've got some, some pottage. I've got some soup here. And if you want some of this, then give me your birthright. And that's what he did. That is not deceptive. That it's not stealing it from him. Right? There was no deception there. But Esau just looked at it all and he just had this, this hatred for his brother because of that. But um, if you remember back in Genesis 25, and this is something that's interesting. In verse 23 it says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So, all the way back in Genesis 25, we, we looked at this, and we, we kind of went into um, Calvinism and why that's all wrong. I'm not going to get into all that again tonight, but um, it was already foreordained from the womb that the elder was going to serve the younger, Right? Now, what happened in the blessing from Isaac? Well, Isaac's blessing was that the person he was talking to, which happened to be Jacob, was going to have the rule over his brethren. 
right, over, over everyone else in the family, that he was going to be in charge. Now, he meant for that to be to Esau, but it actually went to Jacob, right? Because Jacob did this act of deception. So, a lot of people will say, because, because you could say, well, he was just fulfilling prophecy. So, when Jacob did that, he actually did, you know, it wasn't wrong for him to do that because it was foreordained. And you could say, well, God made that happen. A lot of people will say things like that. We'll see God made that happen. And even in Romans 9, because you know, it says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. So saying, see, they didn't even do anything yet. And Jacob was already supposed to be the ruler over Esau. So people will try to justify what Jacob did because of this statement that was made about the elder serving the younger. That was the blessing that Isaac gave unto Jacob, which was intended for Esau. However, Jacob still did wrong. What Jacob did was not right. And here's why. I mean, <laughs> for one, because he lied, right? And the Bible tells us that we're not supposed to be telling a lie. He went in, he did it through subtlety. And here's the other thing we have to remember about about. Bible prophecy or things that God says will happen. It's not that there's only one way that things can happen. Right? Jacob didn't have to lie in order for the elder to serve the younger. Right? He didn't even have to receive that blessing from Isaac in order for that to happen. He didn't have to go in and steal it from his brother in order for that prophecy to come true. We know that God is capable of making these things happen. If you remember, in the, in the, a good example of this is in the book of Esther. Les, can you take care of that, please? In the book of Esther, when Morde, uh, excuse me, Haman had made the, the law that he wanted all the Jews killed, right? King Ahasuerus was married to Esther. Esther was the queen instead of Vashti. And there was this decree that, that all the Jews were going to be wiped out because Haman hated Mordecai. And he wanted them all wiped out. So Mordecai goes to Esther and he says, you need to go to the king. You need to fix this problem. And he's like, how do you know that all the events that happened didn't all happen for such a time as this? Like, like, like you are in the right place and the right time to be able to impact this and able to save all of your people, right? And he said, and she was like scared because she's like, well, I, I, you know, he hasn't called me. I haven't talked to him in a month. You know, I can't just go in and talk to him. You don't understand. If I go in and try to talk to him and he doesn't, you know, grant me grace by, by you know, pointing his scepter toward me. He's like, he, he's going to put me to death. He has to like forgive me essentially for coming in and seeing him when I'm not called. And he hasn't called me. So I could be put to death, you see. And Mordecai's like, look, you need to do this. And he says, don't think that you'll escape from this if you don't do this. And he said, you know what? If you don't do this, God will bring deliverance unto us because God will, will protect his people. God will make sure that it happens. It'll come from somewhere else. He's like, but don't think that you're going to get away. Don't think that you're going to get off scot-free because it'll come back to you because you're not doing your job. And God can make sure that his prophecy comes through that the elder serves the younger in other ways. You don't have to take it upon yourself. Just like Abraham was taking it upon himself to have a child when he was old by taking his handmaid, by taking Hagar, right? God was capable of bringing Isaac unto him. Even in his old age, by doing a, performing a miracle, God did it and God's true to his word. So you can't justify the actions of Jacob here because of that prophecy. No. There is other ways for that to happen that God is completely capable of making sure that it's happening. If it's God's word, you can be sure it's going to come to pass. But it doesn't mean that what he did was right. And oftentimes, you know, God will use heathen nations to come in and judge, you know, judge Israel. But it doesn't even mean that what they did was right. Oftentimes, they'll take it too far. And God's like, well, look, you know, 
and then he goes and, and brings judgment back upon them. But what's really interesting here is how much everybody ends up reaping what they've sown. And what I mean by that, we already know that Jacob, and I'm going to get into Jacob's reaping in the future chapters because we're going to be getting into that when, when he's deceived, when, when he gets Leah instead of Rachel, and that is a big deception for him that comes back around to him. And even his very name, Jacob, we see in the context here of the Bible when he says that um, is not his name rightly, is not he rightly named Jacob? Esau's name because Jacob means he's a deceiver. That's what his name means. And that originally was given to him when he stuck his hand out, remember, of the womb, and then Esau was born, and then Jacob came out after him holding on to his, his foot because the, the thread was wrapped around Jacob's hand because they thought he was the firstborn. But then Esau came up and Jacob was, was on his hand. So in that way, he deceived him into thinking that he was going to be the firstborn, right? And they named him Jacob. And then here we see... Now he is deceiving, right? So that's why he's saying, look, isn't he rightly named Jacob? Because he tricked you and got and stole my birthright. He stole my, my blessing. But, which is also the reason why Jacob's name gets changed later. If you remember when, uh, when Jacob is wrestling with the angel, he asked him what his name was. The angel asked, asked Jacob, and he says Jacob, and his name becomes Israel. So his name is changed to something else. He's no longer the deceiver when, you know, after that whole event. And again, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. But it's real interesting how that happens. But with Esau, last place I'll have you turn, Hebrews 12, we'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 12. And we looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again in this light of reaping what he's sown. Because Esau despised his birthright, now you can say he didn't get tricked, but he, he had zero respect for it. He despised it and didn't, didn't have the respect he should have had unto his birthright. He not only sold his inheritance, but he also lost his blessing as a result of his own sin. Look in Hebrews 12 verse 16, because it clearly says that that's the case. It says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And that's what he did. He didn't get tricked. He sold his birthright. Look at verse 17. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Why was he rejected? For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He, he was rejected. And all this happened as a result of him selling his birthright. When he, when he did that event, when he despised his birthright and sold it for a bowl of soup, it ends up costing him even more than just his birthright. It cost him his blessing as well. And we can see that here from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. It says, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. And he found no place of repentance because Isaac was not changing the blessing. He was saying no, and he didn't change it. So the, the place of repentance, let's just look at that verse real quick. And he, in Genesis 27, it says in verse 38, And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. So in his blessing, he's saying, you're going to serve your brother. Now, is that a very good blessing, saying, well, you're going to serve someone else? No. And he's saying that, like, you know, the, the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, that's where he's going to dwell. He's going to be dwelling, like, outside. He's not going to have some great structure. He's, just, he's going to be, you know, probably more mobile. And he says, you're going to live by your sword. Not a, not a great way to live, fighting, right? And serving your brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off his neck. Finally, though, you will break his yoke from off your neck. That's the only blessing that he has, really. That's, that's really positive to look forward to from Isaac. Which means that you know, he was seek, Esau was seeking a blessing from Isaac. But Isaac didn't repent. He didn't change. He didn't give it to him. He said, this, that's what he told him. 
And it says in verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. Because of the blessing that Esau was, he's like, he hated Jacob. Because he was even told in his blessing that he needs, he's going to serve his brother. So, um, you know, everything comes back around. And when we sin, when we do things that are against God's will and against God's law, it'll come back and get us. And we can be sure of that. You may think that you get away with things for a little while. You may think that, oh, it wasn't a big deal. You know, and oftentimes people will think, uh, people have a tendency to think that, well, you, you know something's wrong. And you say, well, God's merciful. God's long-suffering, right? I'm just going to do this sin because I really want to do it. And the, the satisfaction or what, whatever it is that you're looking to get from a particular sin will be worth it. That's what, that's what all goes on in like everybody's mind, right? This is what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, it'll be worth it. I know, I know I'm going to have to get punished for this, but in the long run, it'll be worth it. It never is. Because when you sow something in the ground, when it grows, it may take a while to grow, but when it grows, it comes back way bigger, right? So if the Bible tells us we're going to reap what we've sown. If we sow to the wind, if we just, we knowingly sin, say, you know what, yeah, I may get punished, but God's merciful, God's long-suffering, you know. He, he won't care that much about it. So you go ahead and sin and you just sow those seeds of sin. It may take a while. You, you, you're going to forget about it. You're going to think, yeah, it wasn't that big of a deal. Right? It was worth it. A lot of people think, yeah, it was worth it. But then later on, you're going to reap the results of what you've sown. And it's going to come back way worse than what, than what you expected. Than what you were thinking. And that is fact. And that is God's word. And that is what he says. That's what his voice is saying. He's saying, you sin, it's going to, it's going to, no one, no one, you're never going to win, win out on the, the punishment versus the reward of sin. Right? The reward of sin is never going to outweigh the punishment, ever. The punishment is always going to come back and get you and smack you a lot harder than whatever it is you think you were gaining by that, by that one, whatever it is that you were planning on doing. Knowingly, willfully just sinning. It'll come back. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for this opportunity we had to, to meet together in a fellowship, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, help us to study your words, dear Lord. Help us to not be ignorant and this to be spoon-fed, dear Lord, but that we would read your words every day and, and um, make sure that we know what your word says and what we're supposed to do with our lives and how we're supposed to think, how we're supposed to act, dear Lord, that we can be responsible for our own actions and knowing what, um, what's true and what's not true. God, help us to be more attentive to your words and to your voice and less attentive to our own feelings, dear Lord, especially when there's a conflict between the voice and the feeling, dear Lord, to help us to, to stick with the voice, stick with your words. We know your word is mighty. We know your word is powerful, dear God. We know that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. We know your words. Especially, you know, only if we've read them or we've heard them, dear God. And I pray that you would please help us to make that important part of our life. But we know your words and help us not to just base our decisions off of feeling, but rather on your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.